And welcome back to Local 4 Plus. I'm Christy McDonald. You're watching us streaming here on Local 4 Plus and click on Detroit.com. We are now bringing you the Mackinac Policy Conference. It's an annual event the Detroit Regional Chamber puts on. Every year you have business leaders, philanthropy heads, politicians, all meeting up on Mackinac Island talking about some of the biggest issues facing Michigan, also talking about politics. We are in a huge election year right now. So they're kicking off the conference who you're seeing speaking right now is Suzanne Clark. She is the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and she is speaking with Detroit Regional Chamber CEO Sandy Barua. Let's go ahead and listen. Has passionate support for all the problems it still has to solve. And, you know, without capitalism, there's no innovation. You know, the drugs that save lives, the, you know, the infrastructure that gets built around, none of that happens without, without capitalism. No, I think as a society, we really expect business to solve a lot of big problems at scale. Right? And that only happens if you have a free enterprise system. So, speaking of free enterprise in America, you have a premier annual event, the State of American Business. What is the State of American Business today in 2024? Well, what we talked about was that the State of American Business feels optimistic. And I think it has to be optimistic. You know, none of you flip open a sign on your door and think no customers are coming, or make the next hire and think I won't have anything for them to do, right? So the idea of investing in a business to start with means that you're somewhat optimistic. And America had record new business starts last year, 5.5 million. And Michigan had the second highest, right. right? There's an optimism to filling out a new business application and saying, this is what I want to do. I think we see a fair amount of secondhand pessimism where people are optimistic about their business, but not necessarily about the overall economy. And there is that dichotomy that we face a lot. But I do think uh, Americans are optimistic people, and people in business certainly are. You know, when people ask me in my role, you know, are you optimistic or not, that's exactly the stat I point to is the record business starts nationally and in Michigan, because that's what we didn't see coming out of the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. In fact, we didn't see new businesses getting formed. Now we are. That gives me tremendous hope. Sounds like it gives you tremendous and hope. And you know, I would also tell you that it's what our adversaries can't figure out. You know, I was just with the premier in China, and we were sitting in chairs like this, and there was a pad of paper here. And when I talk about the 5.5 million, I watch him write it down. You know, because it's the thing you can't make your people do, right? He can't make people spend money. He can't make people start a business. And so figuring out that entrepreneurial spirit is really tough for some of our adversaries. So when you talk to global CEOs, when you talk to uh, global uh, governmental leaders, like you just mentioned, the premier of mm -hmm. China, I know you were recently with the prime minister of Japan, uh, I think maybe the, uh, the prime minister of the UK and others, what are these non-American global business and governmental leaders, what do they say today about doing business in America and with America? Well, one thing is I find both the global government leaders and the global CEOs really curious. You know, how, how do we have an optimistic workforce? How do we have people who want to start businesses? Where does the innovation come from, right? So there's a lot of curiosity. There's also a fair amount of wanting to collaborate. You know, they are a little concerned about what they see as America's retreat from the foreign stage, right? We know that when global GDP goes down, that lots of countries get more nationalistic, more protectionist, and we're certainly seeing that in the United States right now. And that scares some of our allies. So we haven't had a new trade agreement in the United States in a decade. So if 97% of exporters are small businesses, this means they're not getting to foreign markets they would like to get to. That confuses some of the world leaders who are our allies, who don't know. You know, we don't have a US-UK trade agreement, right? That's confusing to the UK. Why do we don't want to do more? But I think largely they see America as a great place to do business. They are concerned about increasing regulatory overreach. And interestingly, when I was in Europe two weeks ago, the number of EU countries that are getting tired of regulatory overreach out of Brussels was really interesting. Because from here, it looks like they're united in their approach. But I think there are a lot of cracks in that scheme. So it's interesting when European leaders are looking to us saying, gee, you guys are awfully bureaucratic because that's what we've always thought of right. them. That's not, a, that's not a good sign for us. So you talk about the threats to free enterprise, mm -hmm. the threats in America, and you know, you know, uh, being part of the U.S. Chamber as a member, I, I've really appreciated 
uh, the leadership that you and your team have taken in really highlighting these, uh, these threats to American business that are coming from, uh, you know, frankly, the regulatory uh, environment. We're seeing kind of some unprecedented uh, reach or maybe overreach uh, in, in regulatory. Talk about the Chamber's approach. First of all, what are some of the biggest threats and what are you guys doing about it? Well, I think the two different questions really, right? There's Fair. the one question which is, are there real adversaries to free enterprise in the United States? And the answer is yes. So there are well-funded foundations. The Hewlett Foundation has pledged 50 to $100 million alone to really try to come up with a new economic model for the United States. They're funding journalists to write negative stories about capitalism. They're funding academics. Um, and our adversaries are using misinformation tools to really make us feel even more polarized than we are, make us feel that we're even more divided than we are. And so I think there are real voices out there trying to take down the free enterprise system. And for those of us in business who just wake up every day and want to open our doors and serve our employees and our customers, it's hard to think about that larger fight. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is we did a study and we looked at the S&P 500 over the course of a decade and every risk that they were listing in their 10Ks. And then we normalized it for language. And what it showed was that over the course of a decade, America's biggest companies said most risk was flat, except for one. And the one risk that they said was growing was public policy risk, and it was up by a third. And it's why what you do in Detroit, what we do together at the national level is so important, because public policy risk, risk from your own government, is really dangerous for business. And it's dangerous mostly because of the uncertainty. If you look at how many elections in the United States are now swing elections, so you go guardrail to guardrail on energy policy or guardrail to guardrail on different policies, no business can make a new strategic plan every 18 months, right? So that uncertainty itself is a risk. So I would say real adversaries, real uncertainty, and then you brought up regulatory risk. You know, there's so much that we need our government to do, that we need a strong, effective, and smart government to do. But when governments start doing things that they don't have the authority to do, when they want to be experts on everything like running your business, then the U.S. Chamber will step in to stop them. We'll start by filing comments on new rules. We'll start with working with regulators to try to get to good rules that would help. But if they continue to overreach their statutory authority, then we sue them. And so we are on our 10th lawsuit this year. You and I were talking this morning about one that we won on the FTC non-competes. And I just want to be clear. If you're a business person, you know how limited non-competes are in their effectiveness. They have to be very narrow. Maybe they're, they're limited to a particular salesperson who knows your market and your pricing and your uh, revenue model. Maybe it's a scientist in R&D. Short amount of time, very small number of competitors. But for the FTC to come out and just declare them not just illegal, but illegal retroactively, we didn't believe that they had the constitutional authority to do that. And we were actually more concerned about the overreach of their authority and what they might do next than even the specific non-compete rule. So we sued, we won on that one, and we just filed a new one last week. OSHA came out with a new rule that said when they were out doing their inspections of your restaurant, your fast food place, your factory, that they could bring a union rep with them to non-union plants. So now you have a safety inspection, which is a good role for the government to play, but making it into an organizing play, which is not OSHA's job, right? So a lot of what we're trying to do is reduce uncertainty by asking government to stay in their lane and do the jobs that only they can do. It is, um, uh, that's a good example of uh, what your organization and what uh, Neil Bradley s says a lot is that, you know, the Biden administration has taken a whole of government approach uh, on, on some of these regulatory and, you know, union organizing uh, issues, you know. So, you know, we, uh, we here obviously had to endure a UAW strike uh, in, in the fall. Um, what is your take on, you know, union organizing efforts across the country? Because we're seeing certainly more activity, not sure we're seeing more success, but certainly more activity. What are business leaders telling you about what's happening with the uh, organized labor movement? Look, I think I'd be interested in what your members are telling you as well. I, what I hear the most is we just want a level playing field. Employees should get to decide for themselves, but we want a level playing field. 
And so when the NLRB or other government agencies, or now OSHA, are trying to tilt the playing field so that union organizers can talk and lobby and do whatever they want in a workforce, but businesses are prohibited to talking to their employees or talking to their customers, that's when CEOs say, hey, we're happy to compete. We can both put our ideas out there and see what the workforce wants to do, but government needs to stay out of it. Well, you talk about going from guardrail to guardrail. We've certainly done that here in Michigan, particularly with right to work. Mm -hmm. You know, we were a right to work state uh, and now we're not. And, you know, that kind of whipsawing back and forth, you know, causes a real problem, especially when we're out there trying to attract new businesses uh, to Michigan because it's the whole, you know, okay, what is your policy today and um, what was it yesterday? Uh, and so that policy consistency or lack of policy consistency, you know, is almost worse than having not quite the right policy to begin with. Sure, we had a speaker recently at the U.S. Chamber and we said, what is, the, what is your preferred immigration policy? And he said, I'd settle for having one. Yeah. You know, and any immigration policy would be a good policy. So I think your point about business wants to know the rules of the road. Right? Business leaders tend to be ethical, upstanding, important members in their community. They want to know what rules they have to play by, and they want some certainty so that they can make a plan. One of the things that I think is confusing about President Biden saying he wants to be the most pro-union president in history is that we're first the first one to walk a picket line. We are in the tightest job market of our time, right? I mean, the wage pressures are incredible. And so I think one of the questions that CEOs have is what problem are we solving? What still needs to be done that we need to be taking very seriously on behalf of our workforces? And what part of this is UAW members who aren't even in the auto industry? You know, where is this movement coming from and what is the ultimate objective? It's college camp, it's college employees. You know, right, uh, right. That's now, the, I think, the largest segment of UAW workers, which seems a little odd to me, but. Yeah, and I think largely unknown by the public, right? And so mm -hmm. when you start to do public sentiment surveys of how do you feel about the UAW and they're thinking, oh, auto workers, I care about that. They're not thinking about what's happening on these college campuses. So level so, playing field, clear communication, represent who you represent. Yeah, and, you know, uh, and just going back to a minute for, you know, the, you know, the regulations that we're seeing, you know, come out of Washington, uh, for those of us who, you know, are really in the auto industry, particularly around the electrification that's happening globally, I mean, you know, our organization firmly believes that, you know, the global market for vehicles is going electrified. You know, some people may you know, view it as a political issue, but at the end of the day, it's a business issue. That's hard to do when all the regulations say you can't use this, you can't use that, you know, in terms of, you know, raw materials and, you know, rare earth materials. And it's like, well, which one? Do you want us to move this way? And if we, if you do, then we need access to these, or do you not want us to move that way? It, it's, it's, you know, for, for our businesses here, it's really confusing. Well, I think this gets back to being strategic, right? We're a great country. We should be able to do the, more than one thing at a time. And so we pretend because, you know, Twitter or X loves outrage and our algorithms love outrage, right? So we pretend that things are really impossible or, or false choices, right? Of course, we should be able to have border security and more legal immigration, right? Of course, we should be able to address climate change and use our own natural resources. Of course, these aren't, you know, choices that you have to make. And yet, these are how business thinks. What's the strategy? What's the compromise? Where are we trying to get? So the problem we have a lot with EVs is that we don't want to do any copper mining, right? We don't want to mine for critical minerals. We have a really outdated electrical grid. And so the state of Maryland, the Mary Kane at the Maryland Chamber, you know her well, will tell you, they'll show you pictures of all of the police cars they were mandated to buy, electric police cars in Maryland. And they're all in a lot because their grid can't support charging them. So it's not that EVs are holistically good or holistically bad, it's what's the strategy, what are we trying to accomplish, and which things can we do in what order? I feel like we don't prioritize well as a country, right? If this is the most important thing, well then we should allow some copper mining, right? We're gonna have to deal with batteries, we're gonna have to deal with lithium, we're gonna have to figure out critical minerals. Um, but I think we need policy makers, not politicians who will speak truth to the people about these issues. We have to do these things to get where we're going. We can't just get there magically. And who understand how business works. You know, that, that you just can't mandate something and all of a sudden people will buy that product or change their consumer behavior 
uh, in a particular way just because there is a new government mandate or regulation. Right. Yeah. So that leads me into kind of public policy and kind of the, the world in which we are all operating in. Um, uh, you and I had a chance to talk just a little bit about the poll that we released on Tuesday, uh, which had some pretty stunning numbers uh, in there. You know, 67% of respondents across the state of Michigan said that democracy was the best form of government. 67% is a pretty low number. You know, we obviously live in an era of polarization, lots of, as you mentioned, Suzanne, lots of disinformation out there. How does the environment, this political polarized environment, impact how you have to operate in Washington and dealing with your members that range from you know, small companies up to the largest you know, companies on the to globe? To the Detroit Chamber. <laughs> well, let's go to some place in the middle at, the, <laughs> at best. Right? Look, I think, again, we're a great country. We can do hard things. Right? And so these dichotomies, these false choices are really, I think, what's getting us into the most trouble. We have to have some kind of strategy here for the things that are facing us the most. And I think whether you're talking to big companies or small companies right now, what do they want? They want more workers. They want more certainty. They want to understand what the rules of the road are. Um, they want access to their materials. Right? They want a, a cooling down of interest rates. And it's cross-party. So if you really talk about polarization, what makes me optimistic about it is the federation. So we have 1,500 state and local chambers we work with every day. They're in real blue states and they're in real red states. And they almost all agree on what we need to do as a country to help job creators, help communities and families, right? And so there are people who are willing to come together and talk, but here's my advice, and I feel this really strongly, and I'm, and I'm, I know I'm not going to seem as nice when I say this, but I, I just think it's really important. I think the business community isn't loud enough because we get polite. And we want to solve problems, and we want to be good to our customers, we want to be good to our employees and our communities, and so we're really polite. And we have abdicated a lot of the primary system in the United States to people on the fringes of both parties. And then so many of these congressional seats are safe that whoever gets through that primary ends up in the general, and people feel like I have no control. These aren't people that I would want to elect. I think we have to get louder in the process, and we have to say impolite things like this. Venezuela was an oil-rich, extraordinarily well-educated country, and they too decided they didn't like democracy. And they are now a single-party communist republic, and all of those formerly wealthy, formerly highly educated people are crawling through jungles to get their children out of there. So the next time someone tells you they're not sure about democracy, I think we have to start being bolder and say, you're right, it's imperfect. You're right, we have more to improve. We're a young country, and we have a lot we haven't gotten right yet. Educational equality, health equity, a lot we haven't gotten right yet. And there's a lot we have gotten right. But the idea that there is some other system of government it really is communism, and we don't say that. We don't say to those 33% of people, there's a name for people who don't like dem democracy, and this is what it is. And I do think in our polite conversation, we are losing the thread of the importance of free enterprise and the importance of democracy while admitting their imperfections. And I think part of what we have to do about it as a federation is not lecture people into liking capitalism or democracy, that never works. But here's what does work. The public really does believe that business is better at responding to demand and consumer sentiment and public sentiment than government. So when we talk about our businesses and our communities as responsive, that's believable. And when we tell local stories, that's really believable. And so you and I and the whole Chamber Federation have to get better at arming people with stories about responsive businesses, local businesses, and reminding people the importance of a system of government. You know, when I kicked off the conference this morning, I used the Edelman Trust Barometer, yeah. which shows business leaders as the most trusted voice that people interact with every day, as media, as uh, other institutions, you know, particularly government leaders, have fallen uh, in trust. And that really kind of puts the onus on, you know, the members that we represent and organizations like ours to really be a voice in public. Because, you know, certainly when I started my career on Capitol Hill back in the, you know, the 80s, 
when we were inventing the wheel, right, as I said this morning. Uh, you know, it was just, you know, the, the business party was the Republican Party, it was the Chamber of Commerce Party. Now it's much more a la carte, certainly from our view here in Michigan. I assume at the national level, it's more a la carte, you know, in terms of who, who you go to, which party you go to to advance right. business issues. I think every issue is its own coalition now. You know, and you just have to make friends on every issue and talk to people. It's a new coalition for every issue. I want to go back to uh, geopolitics for for a second here. So you you kind of commented you commented on how you know global leaders are viewing the United States with you know increasing concern around around regulatory issues. As you scan the globe, the globe's getting it to be a really interesting place. You know these global conflicts are coming home right now. One of our university presidents who was supposed to be on this stage. Uh, tomorrow can't come because of you know the Palestinian you know protests. As you look at Ukraine, as you look at the tensions in the Taiwan Straits, as you look at the Israeli uh, Gaza conflict, how do you bartender? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, there you go. That 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 might be the answer. Um, by the way, when John Boehner was on stage a couple of years ago, he brought his own Bloody Mary. So next time you're on stage, you can bring your own drink. But how do you see that? You know, these global issues impacting well the global economy, the risks. Look, I think this goes back to uncertainty, right? So if when you say things like inflation's at a 40-year historic high. We don't talk about the corollary, which is that means almost no CEO has ever dealt with this interest rate environment, right? Almost no global leader has ever dealt with it. I had a shipping company in my office asking me for advice because the Houthis were shooting missiles at his ships, right? This was not, I did not take the Houthi missile class when I was getting my MBA at Georgetown, right? No I, one is prepared yeah. for these things. And so you think it's a once in a lifetime pandemic and a once in a lifetime supply chain crisis and then war in, Ukraine and then war in the Middle East and then Taiwan and people are overwhelmed. I mean, no wonder people have secondhand pessimism, right? It's, it's an uncertain time and it's an overwhelming time. We have AmCham's, like we have state and local chambers. I connected the AmCham in Israel to the AmCham in Ukraine right after October 7th because one of the things that has to happen if you're Tel Aviv or you're in Ukraine is that you have to keep the economy going as much as you can. And so these business leaders whose, you know, their entire boards and their, and their employees are being called up, and yet they're trying to keep businesses going so they can keep their economy going. I mean, they're really unique challenges. And so, I don't know about you all, but the only way that I find peace in these times is just to get to work, to figure out the allies that we can, to figure out the work that we can do, to turn the worry into work. And I think that's what businesses are good at. And let's face it, I mean, our country, our economy, we got through the turmoil of the 1960s. We got through the Iraq War. We got through the, you know, the pretty serious recessions, both uh, at the beginning uh, of 20, uh, 2007, 2007, 20, uh, 2008, you know, or early 1980s. And you know, our economy keeps growing. So I want to end on, uh, on on kind of a personal uh, note here. So, you know, we are proud that 40 percent of our speakers that are going to be on this stage throughout our conference are, are women. Uh, which is a record for us. We're very proud of that. Uh, we have kicked off today with, you know, our governor Gretchen Whitmer, you know, our chair Suzanne Shank, our um, uh, Alicia Bowler Davis, who used to be an executive at Amazon and GM, and now uh, is CEO of Alto Pharmacy, and Valerie Jarrett, you know, uh, now head of the Barack Obama Foundation, and now we have you. If you need me to help you find some male speakers, I'd be. I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> What is it like being the voice and the face of American business as a woman who's risen to the ranks that you have? That's question number one. I'm going to have a follow-up as well. Uh, um, I'm the first. Uh, there have only been three CEOs of the U.S. Chamber in the last 55 years. So uh, Dick Lesher was CEO for 22 years. Tom Donahue was CEO for 24 years. I've been CEO for three so it is not an institution that changes rapidly. And sometimes I sit in that office in this building that was built 112 years ago, and I think about who had this job in the Depression, who had this job in the race riots, who had this job in the World Wars, and what was that burden like? You know, so I think that carrying the mantle of a 112-year-old organization forward is always a big 
burden, or not burden, but you know, responsibility that I take really seriously. Um, I am the first female to do the job, and I don't know, I mean, I, this sounds sarcastic and I don't mean mm -hmm. it this way, yeah. but I have a hard time with this question because I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what it feels like to be a male CEO. So I'm like, like a little bit complicated <laughs> of an answer, but I would say this. Madeleine Albright once said that she felt men and women are really different and they bring different skills to bear. And she always thought that in some ways being a woman made it easier to be Secretary of State, that she had a range of emotional tools including being surprising in some countries to show up as a woman, you know? So I think we're all using our skills and our gifts the best way we can. So there are situations where it's a disadvantage to be female and there are situations where it's an advantage. And so I think it's just using your gifts the best way that you can. I feel proud of it. I have an only child, she's 18. She's graduating from high school next week. I would accept all of your prayers that I get through Beach Week successfully, please. Um, and I'm really proud when she comes to the chamber and she sees female leaders. We did our trip to the B7 last week to give the business community recommendations to the G7 leaders. The president is Italy this year. And so here you had the president of the G7 is the Italian prime minister who's female. The lead CEO in our delegation was Chrissy Taylor who uh, runs Enterprise Mobility. And I was there and I mean, it, it's changing. It's changing pretty quickly. So uh, leads to my next question, which is, what do you view as the state of progressing women into these top positions? Or do you feel like we've made enough progress or we're still lagging behind, you know, female CEOs? I mean, you know, actually, the last number I saw, actually, there was a dip in the U.S. of the number of female CEOs in the, uh, I think it's either the Fortune 1000 or the Fortune 500. Tammy was very serious that I had to end on time. So in a minute and 27 yeah, yeah, seconds, yeah. I'm going to solve the female executive problem. Oh, great. Perfect. <laughs> Look, here's what I would say. I think there's things society could do to advance more women. I don't think we've really mastered child care and figuring it out. And I think the, the pandemic made that worse. So I think there are things society can do. Um, but I also think there are things women can do. And the truth is that the path to the C-suite is usually running a P&L. And you still see more women... You know, majority female doctors, majority female lawyers. If you look at law school classes, med school classes, but if you look at an MBA class, it's still about a third female. And then if you're not, it's not what you want to study, and then you don't want to run a P&L because more women are still choosing careers in HR or in communications. These are great careers, but they're not the most logical path to the C-suite. So if you're not going to take an international assignment, you're not going to run a P&L, you don't want to get your MBA, then it's going to be a little harder for you to stand back and be angry that you know, you're not on a public company board or you're not in a C-suite. That said, there's more society can do. There's more men can do. And you know, every opportunity I've ever had has come from a male mentor or sponsor. So there are a lot of good guys out there. Well, I'm, I'm glad you think I'm one of them. At least I hope <laughs> it. Suzanne Clark, CEO, U.S. Chamber, we are honored to have you. You're doing an amazing job. I find your leadership really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. And you have one of the best in the country running your chamber. Congratulations. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Distinguished guests, please enjoy this break. The next session begins at 1. Go. All right, and you're watching live uh, day one of the Mackinac Policy Conference. Uh, this happens every year, of course, the Detroit Regional Chamber putting this on. It's this big conference that happens up north, and everyone from business leaders, so you have CEOs from companies across Michigan to politicians from across the state are here, also a congressional delegation. And then you have the heads of nonprofits, um, schools, uh, you know, people come up, and this is not only a great networking opportunity, you have a lot of people talking about how um, they have more meetings up there with people than they could ever get on the books down here in Detroit just because of everyone's schedules. You're all staying at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, so you have CEOs that bump into nonprofit heads and all of a sudden who are talking to politicians, uh, and you really get to start to see where some of these conversations go and end up with policy and with changes that actually impact all of us here living in Michigan. So while I know you sit at home and you watch this and say, what are they really doing up on Mackinac Island, there's a lot of conversations and a lot of policy that 
that comes out of the things that actually start up there at Mackinac. So that's why we think it's valuable to bring this to you here on Local 4 Plus so you're able to see the conversations that are happening on the main stage. Of course, Devin Skillian is up there and he gives us the conversations that are happening off the stage, on the front porch and in the parlor of the Grand Hotel to give us really a sense of what uh, people are talking about. So that was um, Suzanne Clark, who is the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who was talking with Detroit Regional Chamber Chair uh, Sandy Brewer to kind of get everything started. So they're in a break right now, but coming up in less than 15 minutes, Devin Skillian will be on the main stage as the moderator, speaking with Chuck Todd, who of course is the political director at NBC News. He was the moderator of Meet the Press, and now he's in this political role at NBC News. Of course, we have a presidential election this year. There's a lot to talk about there. So stay with us here on the live stream. Uh, click on Detroit.com, Local 4 Plus. You can watch it here. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll get back to that conversation when it starts at 1.45 today. So stay with me.